so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. It was 1991 when a pregnant 17-year-old Bettina Henricks boarded a plane with her new husband. The God-fearing devout Catholic spoke little English. She'd never left Germany, let alone travelled halfway around the world before. But a move to Australia was what had to be done, in response to heaven's calling. The paradise she would build with her husband could not flourish in Europe, he told her, where the traditional values of the Catholic Church were apparently under threat. The teen bride's husband was 41-year-old William Cam. The pair had been bound in holy matrimony on the 19th of March, 1991, at a small church outside of Frankfurt. Bettina wore a high-necked, long-sleeve ivory gown sewn especially for the day by her mother Ingrid. Ingrid had given the union her blessing. This so-called man of God had promised the Henricks salvation. Their recent mystical betrothal had followed a proposal apparently dictated directly from the lips of the Holy Mother herself. Bettina not having reached the age of consent was a detail no match for a marriage blessed by God. After a long flight to Sydney, Bettina was instructed to take off her gold wedding band and put it somewhere safe. Her messiah already had a wife. A small detail William Cam had not yet ironed out. The bewildered pregnant teenager sat nervously through a three-hour drive into the bush to William Cam's property near Nowra on the New South Wales south coast. When Bettina arrived at the Roman Catholic Order of St. Charbel, she'd been promised he was taking her to heaven on earth. But why would heaven need to be surrounded by sky-high fences and barbed wire? As the glimpse of her new life began to settle in, Bettina could not have known within a few short years she would be sharing her husband with her 14-year-old sister, Stephanie. So I went running to mum, help me, I don't want to do this. You have to do this, it's God's will. And I was just beside myself. By the time this doomsday cult would be exposed, dozens of other brides would suffer the sinister consequences of William Cam's so-called divine calling and the abuse that came with it. I'm Emma Gillespie and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. William Cam deceived hundreds, if not thousands, around the world. The self-proclaimed messiah who called himself the Little Pebble led his followers deep into the Australian bush to his promised land of the Order of St. Charbel, Australia's biggest doomsday cult. After its inception in the late 1980s, Cam spun a web of lies, peddling end-of-the-world prophecies to coerce his trusted flock into subservience with the promise of salvation. But when a young girl's diary surfaced, the true horrors of life inside the Order of St. Charbel were revealed. A life of strict hierarchy, coercive control and abuse all hidden from the outside world. Author and investigative journalist Megan Norris has written extensively on cults. Her book, The Messiah's Bride, details the story of the Order of St. Charbel and Stephanie Hinrichs, the 14-year-old girl who would one day expose William Cam and his crimes. Megan joins me today. And before we get started, please note this episode contains discussions of coercive control, child abuse and sexual assault. Listener discretion is advised. What was the order of St. Charbel? How did it come to exist? Well, it was founded by William Cam, who as a young man was a little different. You know, when other teenagers in the 60s were 
growing their hair long and learning guitar so they could be like the Beatles. He was building little altars to his saints and saying prayers to heaven and holding prayer meetings all around the place. And he'd been an altar boy, St. Francis Xavier Cathedral in um, Wollongong, and he'd held his little prayer meetings and rosary groups and stuff and had decided to set up his own Marian work of atonement, it was called. And he'd been off to New York where he'd met a woman called Veronica Lucan. Now, Veronica Lucan was preaching doomsday stuff you know, she'd got a massive following. She was a housewife from Brooklyn and she'd got a massive following with her doomsday preachings. And I think the seeds were planted at that first meeting to New York as a young man. And he came back here with plans to form a little group of his own. And he did. So he started to spout very similar teachings to Veronica Lucan's and started to garner a nice little following of pilgrims which grew quite quickly on his teachings. So he then set himself up in the bush outside Nara at a place called Bangalee, which is it's on the site of a deserted caravan park near the Shoalhaven River. But he claimed it was the Lords of Australia and he'd found his promised land and his sacred ground on his promised land. And then lo and behold, he hadn't been there very long. This would be the mid-80s. The Holy Mother started to visit him and he began to have apparitions, a bit like Joan of Arc. And the Holy Mother was a very frequent flyer to his Holy Land. She came at three o'clock on the 13th of every month to visit him and deliver God's divine directions to the new Messiah on earth. And um, a lot of people believed this. So there would have been about 250 resident acolytes living on the promised land in Kambawara when Stephanie's family joined in 1991. And there would be thousands more coming in their droves on the 13th of every month, which he called Atonement Day. So they all came. And Stephanie recalls buses coming from the airport with people from Singapore and New Zealand and Fiji. And they all poured in once a month to witness William Cam, aka Little Pebble, receive his divine guidance from the Holy Mum. But interestingly, only he could see her and only he could hear her. So he would impart these messages and tell everybody what she was telling him he had to do. St. Charbel, the Virgin Mother, these are Catholic-sounding ideas and beliefs, but Catholicism at its core does not have a doomsday approach. (laughs) How did the beliefs of the order distance themselves from, I suppose, traditional Catholicism? Well, I think he preyed on fundamentalist traditional Catholic worshippers. And they were good Catholic people. Yeah, they were. And they were people that were disillusioned with the way the modern Catholic Church was going. So at that time, Stephanie's family are German and they lived in Munich and they were strict Roman Catholics devout Roman Catholics. Stephanie's mother's view was one of disillusionment. She felt that the traditional way of worship was being eroded by a progressive modern Catholic church. And it was sort of becoming a hybrid of the Protestant and Catholic faiths, which she didn't like. So they took away prayer rails in the 80s in Germany. So she couldn't say mass the way she wanted. And she couldn't even say mass at her local church. She had to travel into the city to the cathedral to say mass there. And so there were a lot of people like Stephanie's mum who were pretty disillusioned with this modern church. So William Cam sort of seduced them with this idea that he in Australia, on his holy land, his righteous flock were going to worship in the traditional way, the way God intended, the way God intended according to William Cam. So they would follow the vows of poverty, which he didn't, the vows of chastity, which he also didn't. And, you know, sort of purity. He was sort of preaching old-fashioned tenets that he then began to manipulate. So the word of God, according to William Cam, wasn't quite the word of God. And the Catholic Church despised him, the true Catholic Church in Australia. He was in all sorts of strife over a long period of time, and he was on their radar for years and years. So he was seen really as, and I think it's the same with a lot of these religious sects, they're sort of breakaway groups from the main church. But it's when those beliefs become harmful to the members, harmful or dangerous or illegal or criminal, as they were in his case, that 
there's that crossover. They're no longer a religion. They're a cult. I can't help but wonder if our listeners are going to chuckle at the idea that the Catholic Church had become too modern for its more devout following. (laughs) But there were enough people disillusioned, as you mentioned, for William Cam to travel around the world. In a pre-sort of social media age, how did he end up in Germany with a following and how did that lead him to Stephanie's family? After he got a more than a straggly band of pilgrims, he had quite a few people paying attention to his nonsense. He decided to do a global sort of road show and he began at the heart of the Catholic faith at the Vatican where he wangled a photo of himself with the Pope. He banded the photo around and claimed that he had a private audience with the Pope. And the photo was, in William Cam's words, the photo was evidence that the Holy Father himself had endorsed William Cam's visions of the Holy Mother, which was a nonsense. That had not happened. And that resulted in a very stern letter from the Vatican to the Bishop of Wollongong over here, putting them straight. But William Cam, he'd already begun. His journey to paradise had already begun. So he went all across Europe preaching to the faithful. And a lot of people in Stephanie's Catholic community in Munich, where they lived, they were very excited. They'd heard about this new foreign messiah that was seeing visions of the Holy Mother. You've got to remember they were fanatically religious. So, you know, Stephanie's family spent their summer holidays visiting apparition sites around Europe that were famous for supposed visions of the Holy Mother. So they were really quite primed for that. So there was a bit of a buzz in Munich when William Cam was arriving, and he was giving a prayer rally in a place called Westphalia, which was about a two and a half hour coach trip. And there were a convoy of coaches going from Munich and other parts of Germany to hear this new unlikely Aussie Messiah preaching the word of the Lord directly from heaven itself through the Holy Mother. How did we go from William Cam is preaching in Germany to the Heinrich family are entangled and Stephanie's older sister becomes engaged to William? He's a typical predator. I think we have to remember that and stop thinking of him as a religious man because he definitely was not. You know, religion was just license to offend, really. He was very seductive. He preyed on people, as predators do, that are vulnerable. He befriended this family. Of course he did. She had a big family of beautiful children. They're Catholics. He took them out for dinner. He spoiled them. He went on day trips. He basically groomed and primed them. And he very quickly determined that Stephanie's mum was looking for something to believe in. And her sisters say that, that mum was desperately looking for something to believe in. She'd had a very hard and deprived life of abuse. So had the kids. He figured that out pretty quickly. He's a predator. And they were looking for something better. And he offered them that. You know, in my righteous community, we follow the faith the way God intended He gets into their heads. You know, what are your dreams? What would you like? Stephanie's a little girl living in an apartment with a sandpit outside. All she wants is a horse or two. Well, you know, there's room in paradise for you to have those horses. He says to mum, what about you? Oh, I'd like to live somewhere where I grow my own food and I'm self-sufficient. Well, you could do that. That's what my flock do in Australia. And Bettina, who was looking for a father figure, they had a very abusive, dangerous father who was jailed and eventually died when they were young. Bettina was looking for a father figure and for some love and support, and he offered her that. He told her the Holy Mother had sent him especially to Germany to help her to heal her hurts, and she wanted her hurts to be healed. So, you know, she was primed. So he then proposed in a bizarre 19-page fax from his farm in the bush, he proposed marriage to Bettina. And how old was Bettina at that point? She was 17. She was 17 years old. And he said God had chosen her. It was like a 19-page a fax of pseudo-religious babble. But amongst there was this bizarre proposal straight from the lips of the Holy Mother saying that Bettina had been chosen by the Lord to be William Cam's new wife at 17. And he was 44. But at that time, he already had a wife and kids back in Australia. I do want to ask you about that deception in a moment, 
But first, I want to understand a little bit more about life in the order. What did a typical day in St. Chabelle look like? Once Patina is brought to Australia to her, you know, paradise near Nowra, what would her life have looked like? Well, it wasn't a paradise. It looked like a prison of war camp. It had security guards on the gates, double lock gates and rolls of barbed wire all along the top of it, seven metre high hurricane fences with barbed wire. So their lives weren't looking too promising from the time they arrived. They were certainly away from the evil of the modern world. But Bettina's life basically became one of drudgery from the start. So he sort of used Bettina as bait to get the rest of the family out here. So he proposed his marriage, brings her out here, tells her on the plane to lose the wedding ring. He's going to introduce her as the nanny to his existing wife, a very hale and hearty wife that he said was about to die and be called away to heaven any day soon. And her life became bathing babies, reading stories. She was basically became the nanny to his children. And then later on, when he did marry her, because the wife sniffed it out pretty quickly and left, her life became one of drudgery. She was a breeding machine. She was chosen by the Lord to help him populate the new era in paradise. And her job was to produce a new generation. So her life became one of pregnancies, babies, mayhem and general drudgery and abuse. What was she told about why she needed to take the ring off, why she couldn't tell people she was pregnant? She was very young and impressionable. So he told her that God had big plans for him and that all would become clear when it came to pass. But until that time, his poor wife was about to be called away to heaven and stricken with terminal cancer and called away to heaven, basically. But he thought it might be cruel to tell her that but she would know once she developed the symptoms and became stricken and she would get sick very quickly. So it would be kinder if they didn't tell her just yet that Bettina had been chosen to step into her shoes as soon as she was called away by God. And Bettina's job would be to raise his motherless children and help him through his grief. Basically, that's what he told her. He told her that, you know, Anne was going to have enough on her plate when she knew she got cancer. And it was probably better if they didn't tell her just yet you know, and he said, all will become clear. And if the news gets out too soon, you will ruin God's bigger plan. And she was terrified of ruining God's plans for him because they were so big. And she never said a word. But some of the righteous moral guardians in the community quickly sort of spotted that the relationship between William Cam and his new German nanny wasn't quite the relationship it seemed. And when that was drawn to Anne's attention, she packed up and left. A number of people left at that point. But, you know, God had bigger plans for him, so he took it in his stride. And by coincidence, the Holy Mother's messages in the days that followed Anne's departure were full of warnings and messages about the importance of trusting God in all that he decided. And so basically they were told to have more faith in William Cam. And he said that, you know, he would forgive those that trespassed against him when God's plan became clear. And they'd all feel really sorry that they'd judged him in this way. For those who stayed and continued to follow him, how is it that he was able to seduce them with his ideas or convince everyone to stay? Did the members of the sect have access to the outside world, outside media? Were they allowed to go to mass elsewhere, live in the community outside of those fences? Some people did. Remember, he had about 500,000 followers globally. That's huge. He had 250 people living, residents living in Camberwara alone, another big community in Tyak in central Victoria, another community near Geelong in Victoria, a community in Queensland and a smaller community in Adelaide, a huge offshoot of the cult in Canada and lots of disciples all around the world. So he pulled a fair amount of clout. His teachings were embraced by most. And I think it's typical cult behavior. You geographically isolate a group of people. You take them out of mainstream society and you preach to them. So they heard his teachings. Then they believed in his messages, so they heard his ideas all over again, bizarre as they were. They were hearing them from the Holy Mother herself via God's prophet on earth. They were hearing them from William Cam. They were hearing them from his 
priest who was actually not licensed to be a priest in Australia or anywhere else at the time because he'd been defrocked in Texas. So they were hearing them in the priest sermons. They'd go to confession, you know, they were hearing those messages reinforced. It's typical conditioning. It's what they call deprogramming, deconfiguration, where you take a group of people, isolate them, fill them with your beliefs so that the only perspective they end up having is yours. And, you know, he's a charismatic, powerful, convincing con man, and they believed him. Some families had televisions. Stephanie's family had a television. She learned English by watching soap operas, so she had a TV. Some of them worked outside the community, but mostly on William Cam's projects or sometimes for other devotees who ran businesses and lived outside the community. So there were people who lived outside the fences, but they believed in him and they came to pray and they believed in his teachings and they ran small businesses that his disciples worked in or those disciples more commonly worked for William Cam's businesses and he made the money. I was going to ask you next about the money. With so many followers around the world, aside from his abusive and sexual desires, was there money to be made as the leader of this sect? Well, he became very, very wealthy. And I know that at some stage when the cult was in decline, there was a Senate inquiry into how he was able to garner even more money and there were more donations still flooding in even after he'd been convicted as a sex offender and a con man. So, you know, there were a lot of people who were supporting his mission and believed in his mission, his mission being to save the world, to save mankind at the end of the world. They believed in his crazy prophecies and they were varied and all equally as bizarre as one another. And his messages from the Holy Mother got wilder and more outrageous with every atonement day service that's what he called the 13th of the month that was atonement day where they all atoned and then the holy mother told them what they had to do next or rather told him what he had to do next and then he told everyone else what they had to do because god said so it's brainwashing so it's a bit like emptying a hard drive on a computer and reprogramming it with new thoughts and it's been identified as a form of deconfiguration and reprogramming that is used to radicalize young terrorist recruits it's that same what turns ordinary, well-educated, middle-class men from good families to become killers because they believe in the cause that they're fighting for. And it's all indoctrination. And basically, he was the expert at indoctrination. Bettina is his wife, but the rest of her family, as we know, follow from Germany. When did her younger sister, Stephanie, arrive? And what kind of a world was Stephanie stepping into as a young girl, specifically in terms of the role of women and girls within the order? How was she expected to dress? How was she expected to behave? What was that like? Well, they, she said they basically became a flock of sheep. Obviously, because the Holy Mother decided William Cam needed 84 wives, young ones, most of them were being primed to be queens in his new royal house of David in the bush. So it was traditional, you know, they followed traditional values that the women did women's things, they worked around the place, Stephanie helped in the garden. In Germany, she'd been quite a free spirit, but William Cam's constant visits, he was sort of priming them in advance to adopt his clothing. So they were already wearing this weird hippy-dippy clothing, this long stuff and covering their hair with headscarves and dressing in the way that his followers were dressed in Australia because he told them that was what the Holy Mother wanted. So they had to cover up. You couldn't show cleavage. That was sinful. Young men couldn't show their muscular arms and legs. They had to wear pants and it was too tempting. They weren't allowed to wear jeans because that accentuated the buttocks and sexual areas, so he said. So basically he had the flock cover themselves up and they were living a sort of puritanical sort of existence, really, where they were growing their own food. And some people did work for other members. You know, one of Stephanie's sister worked for someone outside in the community, but they were still a member of the cult. They just lived outside. And the men worked for William Cam. They fixed up the place. They did the maintenance work. Interestingly, Stephanie's mother said he was very good at instructing people and delegating, but he didn't actually get his own hands dirty. He just made money off everything. So, you know, the women would do a communal cook-up. 
They would all have communal meals and they went to church a lot. So it was very ritualistic prayers at all times of day and night. Megan, I want to ask you about William Cam's set of rules for his followers, his puritanical guidelines and ways of life against his own behaviour, what we know about his sexual appetite, the way that he treated women and children, let's be honest, they were children. Where did that come from? Is it tied to his notion that he needed to sort of scatter his holy seed? Well, he's a predator. That's where it came from. He's a sexual predator. He wanted sex with young women, lots of. And it's a power thing too. You know, he's very powerful. He's got a narcissistic personality. And later on, we know when cases came before the courts, you know, various psychiatrists that assessed him said he had a paraphilic disorder too. And pedophilia is a paraphilic disorder. So he used religion as a license to offend. He used his fake messages from the fake Mary as license to offend. That's all it was. You know, he manipulated the Bible's teachings basically to convince his trusting flock, brainwashed trusting flock, that this was what he had to do. And he would say, you know, pluck out passages of the Bible that in the Bible, in the Old Testament, King David was told to build the 12 tribes of Israel by choosing 12 wives. And those wives would bring forth a new race. And that would be the 12 tribes of Israel. And from then would flow a new generation. Well, you know, he's preaching doomsday. So, you know, he's saying the end of the world's coming. I've got to populate the earth with a new race. And God has supposedly instructed him that he has to do this and that only he possesses the holy seed, and that he's been told that only he possesses the holy staff that contains the holy seed, and therefore it's incumbent on him to scatter his holy seed far and wide around that flock, and all these wives that he's been told by the Holy Mother to choose, 84 of them, will immaculately conceive his holy seed and bring forth a new generation. Now remember, that flock believe in the immaculate conception of Jesus Christ. They believe that. So it's tapping into their beliefs and he's exploiting them and manipulating them to basically do what he wants to do and gratify himself and his own sexual interests. How did he land on the 84 mystical wives number? Where did that come from? And how did Stephanie become one of them? They just grew wilder, these supposed prophecies from the Holy Mum. So he started off saying he had to choose 12 wives and they would be the elite Marys. They would be like the Holy Mother because they would immaculately conceive children in the way she had conceived Jesus Christ. And it was a blessing and their names would be forever revered in paradise. And so the families were really excited when their daughters were chosen because they believed that their daughters were special, like Mary. He then decided he needed 72 princesses in this royal harem of his I don't know where he came up with that. I don't think anybody really does. And then he threw a few baronesses in the mix. He had a sort of royal pecking order. So the queens would be at the top and they would rule in paradise and be the founding mothers of his new era, his new Garden of Eden. The 72 princesses would be sort of servants to the queen. I just think he had a great imagination. You know, they were going to be servants to the queens and they would help the queens, but they would also have to conceive his holy seed. And the baronesses would be more like, servants to the princesses and would be like nannies in their royal house and all the queens would live in fantastical castles in Bavaria with all the brood of children and Stephanie was going to have 27 children in his new era 27 so if the girls were not sure or if anyone was not sure he would advise them to write to the holy mother So all these doubting acolytes, if they did have any doubts, well, for a start, if you had doubts, you were told that Satan was trying to tempt you from the true path that God had chosen for you. So that was a fear. I think he used that sort of fear of retribution. If you don't believe or you reject his will, you're rejecting the will of the Lord and you could find yourself being locked out of paradise and perishing along with all the other sinners in Nara. So, you know, it sort of kept people obedient and compliant He used that. He manipulated their faith. So he sort of persuaded them that this is what they'd been chosen to do. And it was a great privilege and an honor and it would bring them blessings. So that was reinforced in the minds of the parents 
who reinforced it again in the minds of the children. And if you had doubts, you could write a letter to the holy mum and he would offer it up on atonement day and write down her answers. So Stephanie would write these heartbreaking letters saying, dear holy mum, is this really what God wants for me? And the holy mum would say, you know, be patient, little poppy, you know, God has chosen the man for you already, the man who will be your husband. He's a man you never thought you could ever possibly marry. And Stephanie thought that was Keanu Reeves because that was the man of her dreams at the time. She would seen him in speed. So when he sort of teased her with the idea that the Holy Mother and God had already chosen the man she couldn't possibly ever have dreamed in her wildest dreams of marrying, she just assumed that was Keanu Reeves. She never dreamed it was William Kemp. <laughs> Doesn't that just speak to the innocence of a 13-year-old girl? And as much as we laugh at that, there's something so sinister to imagining that innocent girl, that child, and what her life became. That's so true. And the letters that she wrote, full of doubt, and they were really conflicted letters of a confused little 13-year-old girl Basically, a 13-year-old girl trying to be a normal teenager in that warped, weird world of William Cann. You know, she was trying to be a normal teenager. So she was being fed this stuff. You know, God wants you to take the mystical path and be William Cann's mystical wife or the Little Pebbles. Mystical wife, you'll be one of the elite 12 Marys. And that started to lose its appeal when she realized, because he fed them it bit at a time, you know, he didn't hit them with the whole horrible picture in one go. The Holy Mother's prophecies grew and changed and evolved over time. Because when she realized that it meant being married to him forever and she could never have another partner, and she thought she was going to conceive the Holy Seed immaculately, she thought it was a holy hug or a holy kiss or something. She didn't know what it was. And then the letters sort of started to change. So the fake Holy Mother's letters are very telling because they change direction and they slowly start to become more sinister as they're, first of all, persuading her she wants to accept to be a queen, a Mary, and then persuading her that, well, God's got another plan now. You can now choose to take the natural way to paradise or the mystical way to paradise. And Stephanie didn't like the sound of the natural way to paradise she wanted to do the Holy Immaculate Conception. So she said she didn't want the natural way to paradise. So one of her letters, she writes back saying, you know, I'll stick with the spiritual path that God's chosen for me. The reply basically was, well, no, you won't. God's now decided he wants you to take the natural path. And basically that's that. So that's God's will. So if you can see, it's like a slow seduction process. And basically all roads led to sex with William Cam, underage sex with William Cam. How did the other brides feel about sharing William Cam amongst the sect? Was there a sense of sisterhood, camaraderie, that this is what we're here to do to help him spread this holy seed? Was there jealousy? I can't understand between sisters especially that must have been a strain on their relationship. Well, Bettina didn't know that Stephanie had been chosen for a long time. And Bettina believed it was immaculate conception because he had told her that these would be mystical spouses, not physical wives, that she was special. She was the queen of all queens. Their relationship was physical and real, a real marriage. But the others would be mystical spouses. So they wouldn't have a sexual or physical relationship with him. They were simply chosen to immaculately conceive his seed for procreational purposes only. They were not special to him in the way that she was. So he overcame that with her, and then he swore the queens to silence. So each one that was chosen, it's a bit like he did with Bettina when they arrived here. If she told anyone she was married to him, that would compromise or jeopardize her entry into the new era by compromising God's bigger plan. So he sort of said this to Stephanie too. Bettina doesn't need to know because... If word gets out too soon, it will ruin everything, basically. And he was saying that to the others. But yes, he fostered jealousy amongst the young queens. Over time, as people became aware, he called a royal meeting once, a royal summit of all his queens because they were squabbling and arguing. And somebody who'd had a baby wanted to be the top of the pecking order and wanted to replace Bettina. 
And this young girl who'd had a baby sort of became his favorite for a while. And she wanted to be the queen of queens. So she was jockeying to get Bettina out so she could be the queen of queens. And it caused this resentment amongst the girls. So there was a bit of cat fighting going on in the royal house. And so he called a royal summit and he had a royal advisor to the queens, a royal counsellor. So this woman's job was to keep those naughty queens in line. And Stephanie was a particularly difficult queen. She argued, she challenged and questioned. And Stephanie said she remembers going to this royal summit and they all had to sit in a circle and air their grievances, but no one wanted to. So basically, William Cam took over and silenced them all and said, Bettina's the queen of queens and that's it. She's my true wife and that's that. And you've all got to stop this. You're all special. You've all been chosen. You know, behave yourselves. And Stephanie said she remembers looking around the room and counting all these girls and thinking she now knew who they were, obviously, and Bettina knew that Stephanie was a queen now because they were all having this meeting. But she said she looked around the room and counted about 24 people. And she said, God's always changing his mind. You know, I thought you said there were 12 queens. Well, there's 24 I can count. And she said, but then God was always changing his mind because he was always changing his mind about doomsday. The doomsday that never came always changed. And he would say, well, God's changed his mind and postponed doomsday because our prayers have saved us. So he had an answer for everything. <laughs> were there any men around at this time? It strikes me that we've got one leader impregnating dozens of women. Were those women supposedly in relationships with the other men or did it become this kind of harem of William and his wives? Yes, because only William had been chosen and only William possessed the big white shining thing or the holy staff as he called it, which it referred to it in some places as a shining white thing or the big white thing. And it was the holy staff bearing the holy seed had been given to him by God and him alone. So only he could do it. But there was dissent because at one stage, Stephanie was banished to another community for playing up. And when she came back, there was a lot of animosity and there was a memo sent out. He sent out a memo to all his queens and to all these men because if you were a queen, you couldn't have another man in your life. You couldn't even be seen walking with a boy. Stephanie got into trouble for walking alongside another teenage boy. That's all she did. She got into terrible trouble for that. So you weren't allowed to have other partners if you were one of the queens. And even though he started off persuading people to be princesses, that very quickly changed when the Holy Mother sent letters saying, no, how do you feel about being a queen instead? So he didn't really want princesses with other men. Princesses were supposed to be allowed to have other men, but not really. So what he would do is when Stephanie came back from her banishment, Cam sent out a memo to everybody because there were usurpers in the group. So some of the men had decided, if we're in such a hurry to populate the new era, wouldn't it make more sense if we could all have wives and we could all share the Holy Seed? And he sent out a furious memo, it's the most bizarre memo, basically putting them in their place, saying, no way, only I and I alone will possess the Holy Seed. You don't possess it. That's making a mockery of God's rules. And no, the queens cannot have other husbands and you can't have wives. Only I can have multiple wives. So there was a lot of dissent in the ranks from the men too. People started to question him. He makes it sound like Disneyland meets Game of Thrones, but I have to keep reminding myself that we're talking about a caravan park outside of Nowra yeah. in regional New South Wales. Exactly. I find that quite amusing, you know, because he said it was the Lords of Australia because it had a sacred spring or something of that kind. But I think that was the thing when I was writing this book. It's so out there that you have to start to remember that and remind yourself that they believed this. And they really believed it. And for those who didn't or started to question it, well, they got sent away to work somewhere. So, you know, he would separate families. And that's a really common technique in cults where the children are cared for communally by various adults in the community. The discipline of those children is shared by other adults in the community. So the family unit becomes eroded and the power that parents would have over their children 
becomes eroded. So he would send husbands away to work. He sent Stephanie and her stepfather to work on an egg farm in Victoria because Stephanie's stepfather was starting to have questions. And Stephanie was constantly refusing to be a good wife. He said she was a lousy wife. You know, he said she wasn't behaving like a proper wife because she stalked off down the road and wouldn't do as she was told. So every time that happened, he sent them away for a bit. And then when they were behaving, he brought them back. When Stephanie was behaving like a teenager, because she was. She was behaving like a typical adolescent. Some of her questions in those letters, they are actually very poignant because she will say, dear Holy Mother, is this really what God wants for me? Do you really want me to do this? And is there some other way I can go to paradise without having to be one of the 12 Marys? Can you find me another role in paradise? But the Holy Mother never could find another role. She was always going to do what God wanted. But in between that, you'd see, P.S., is it okay if I have a sleepover at somebody's house on Saturday? Or P.S., dear Holy Mum, would it be okay if I dyed my hair? And the Holy Mum said, no, it wouldn't be okay. And Stephanie dyed it bright red anyway. So she was still being a rebellious adolescent girl where she could. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Emma Gillespie. I'm speaking with journalist and author Megan Norris about cult leader and sexual predator William Cam. When did the abuse start in the relationship between Stephanie and William? Well, she said it started subtly. So it started when she was 13. Once the Holy Mother had revealed Stephanie's true purpose on this earth, which was that she was chosen to be a Mary, and Stephanie was sort of agonizing over whether she wanted to do that. So the letters to and fro reflect that conflict, you know. But he started. So she was constantly being sent over to Bettina's house, to William Cam's house, to help Bettina with all her children because Bettina either was pregnant or she'd got all these kids. she got a gang of kids. And so Bettina would be struggling with all those children and being pregnant again. So Steph would be sent over to help with the kids. So she'd bath the babies and everything. And he started groping her. And he would do it in a very voyeuristic way. So she said she recalls sitting at the kitchen table once, having a conversation with her sister, with William Cam sitting there. And all the time they were having this conversation, he was rubbing her legs under the table and rubbing her thigh. Or he'd bump into her and brush her breast as she walked past him. She was 13. And then another time she was over there. And as she was about to leave, he gave her a passionate kiss on the lips behind Bettina's back. And she said she felt terrible. She bolted out of the house and she felt shameful that she had done something to invite that attention, that unwanted attention. And that if Bettina had found out or had seen it, Bettina might blame her for behaving inappropriately. But it was totally confusing to her. And these days, you know, as she started to mature, she felt that he was undressing her with his eyes. He was looking at her in a different way. His behavior around her was more touchy-feely more tactile than it had been when she was a little girl. Although, even as a little girl in Germany, he was very keen on, you know, grabbing them on his knee and cuddling and kissing them and everything. But it became more sexual. And there was something troubling about it that made her feel really, really ashamed and guilty, as though she'd done something wrong. When did Stephanie fall pregnant? And how did that impact on her, I suppose satisfaction within this life did that prompt her to start to think about getting out yes well she wanted to become pregnant the illicit sexual relationship began when she was 14 and he would creep her out of the compound on the floor of the car he'd have a hide on the floor of the car which she thought was really strange given that god had given it his blessings and he'd drive her to this motel for these sexual twists that she didn't want this unwanted sex And he told her that the reason it was secret was he didn't want Bettina to find out because she'd be insanely jealous. And she was scared that that might be true and Bettina might blame her. They were regular jaunts. Sometimes he'd take Stephanie on her own. Sometimes he'd take her with another Mary. They'd all go. So he had this sort of voyeuristic scene going on. She then decided, she saw the way he was treating Bettina. And she realized that when Bettina was on pregnancy number five, He'd lost complete interest in her. Obviously, he had lost interest in her because he got all these other girls on the go. And she suddenly had this epiphany where she thought, well, maybe I should get pregnant and then he'll leave me alone. 
you know, he'll lose interest in me too and I won't have to do this anymore. Maybe the baby is the lesser of two evils. So she decided that was what she wanted. But she'd been so naughty, he went through a charade of writing to the Holy Mother for permission for her to become pregnant. And he gave her, or rather the Holy Mum did, gave her till Easter Sunday to fall pregnant or else. So she said there was a lot of intense activity and the Holy Staff was getting a very good workout during January and February of 1998 while she conceived this child. And typically, as she predicted, the minute she discovered she was pregnant, he stopped and lost all interest in her, which she was hoping would happen. So the baby, in some ways, became a gift for her, and it was something of her own. By then, though, she was 19. So by the time she got pregnant, she was 19, and yet this relationship had been going on for five years, this illicit relationship. So she had the baby, and she was deeply depressed. And I think with postnatal depression, you know, it went untreated because obviously they were not too keen to take her to a doctor who would delve into why she was so depressed and it might unearth a horror story that nobody really wanted to come out. And remember, this cult operated within themselves. They didn't really like outsiders outside of the cult knowing things. So Stephanie had the baby, was deeply depressed. And he sort of recognized that she was. Her sister, Bettina, recognized and her mother recognized that she was very depressed. So she was sent to his community in Victoria for a while. And away from his influence and his doomsday messages, she actually felt better. And everyone helped her with the baby. But then as soon as she felt better, he made her come back. And then she was sent to Sydney because she was still depressed. And she said she realized then every time she came back, she felt worse than before. And it was the cult, it was living there that was making her so depressed. She felt that if she didn't get out, she would die. She felt so despairing. And she was suicidal. So um, he sent her to some disciples who lived in Sydney. And she discovered a telephone hotline called Hot Gossip. And these were the days before internet matchmaking sites and Tinder and things like that. So she discovered this telephone site called Hot Gossip. And she met a man on this telephone site. She was secretly making these phone calls. And she met a man who she started sneaking off to see in Sydney. And he was a bit older than her, quite a bit older than her too, an older man. And um, she told him she was a single mum with a young child living in a rural community, a religious community. And that was all she told him because she didn't want to scare him. She didn't tell him it was a cult with armed guards and locked doors and locked gates or anything. And he drove her back there once after one of their illicit meetings and dropped her off. And he could see the rolls of barbed wire and the seven meter high fences. And he realized that it was a cult she was living in. He said, you've got to get out of there. And she knew that. So that blossomed into a romance. But I think really it was more a dependent relationship for Stephanie because he offered her a ticket out. Because can you imagine You've grown up. She came from Germany speaking no English. She learned English in the cult. She spent her life in the cult. She didn't know anyone outside the cult that wasn't a follower of William Camps. And she had no means and no money. So she didn't really have an escape until she met this guy. And so she did actually announce, and she was very bold, that she was going to go and live with this man in Sydney. And when she did, everybody turned on her, basically. They were horrified. They said, you know, one of the ladies said to her in the cult, you will die. You are turning your back on God, on your faith, and you will die. You will get sick and you will die and your baby will get sick and he will die and that will be your fault. And she believed that. That was ingrained in her, that fear of hell. And she said, oh, I was on the verge of just not doing it. She told me, I was just about to say I've changed my mind when William Cam came over and said to her, if you really want to go, you can go with my blessing. And she's not sure why that came about, even to this day. I sort of think she'd become really problematic and a challenge to him, and she was making a noise. And the man she'd met was an unknown quantity. But I think maybe he had a bit of apprehension about what it would mean if he said no what might happen if he said no. And so he gave her his blessing. But I also think it was to regain control over the cult. He had to make be seen to make the decision. He couldn't have her rejecting him and walking off. He had to be seen to give her permission to maintain that hold over the people who remained, I think. 
It strikes me that Stephanie sort of had always all along this self-awareness that perhaps the others didn't have. When do you think that self-awareness transformed into not trusting William, being sceptical of the messages and his connection to the Holy Mother because it can't have just been that she was depressed, got on a chat line and met a man. There must have been early seeds of doubt all the way through. But when do you think she began to really take those doubts very seriously? When the letters started coming from the Holy Mother, I do believe that the doubts were all the doubts were clearly already there because she was expressing them in her letters. She was questioning the supposed word of the Lord. She was watching everyone and she said it was like living in a parallel universe. You know, she was thinking, How can you not see what I can see? But of course she'd raise those doubts and be told by the priest, you know, his defrock priest basically to pray more and trust in the Lord and all this stuff. But she wasn't because she was challenging and she was refusing to return his passion. And he was complaining bitterly. But every time she refused to return any passion at all, she said she learned to play dead. The Holy Mother would write a nasty letter to her mother, telling her mother to make her daughter pull her head in. So, you know, that rebellion was always there. She was always questioning. That's why she kept getting sent away. And then she'd be seen with boys, so she gets sent away. Then she started arguing with her mother, saying, well, how do you know that he's hearing the Holy Mother? How do you know God wants this? Who says? How do you know? No one ever sees those messages. So she was always questioning it. That was at 13, 14, 15. It went on and on. And then she would be terrified into submission because she said to me, deep down, there was a little voice in her head because she'd been programmed. But what if he's telling the truth? but what if he is? And I'm wrong. But it was there all along. And there was a scene she described when she was a teenager, long before she got pregnant, she'd be about 16. And he predicted that the end of the world was coming right now. And that hale Bop's comet was hurtling through the skies at that time in 1997. And stargazers around the world had been watching this super comet, you know, trailblazing through the skies. And they'd all predicted that there'd be a sort of meteor shower and they would watch hale Bop's comet passing Earth for the first time in thousands and thousands of years. He used that to say, here it comes, the end of the world is coming, we're going to be annihilated. So he packed them all off, all the disciples into Nara to Mitre 10, and they all had to buy black plastic from Mitre 10, which must have been a really ridiculous spectacle because it was April Fool's Day. She remembers distinctly that it was April Fool's Day, and they were buying up all this black plastic, which she then watched them all wrapping up their houses in black plastic to stop the blinding light, the radiant heat coming through the windows and and striking them all, blinding them all. So they were wrapping all the houses up and she remembers lying on the sofa, laughing her head off to herself, thinking how absurd it all looked. Her sister was piling cushions on the floor, bringing all the children together. They were all praying. And Stephanie was lying on the couch with a drink thinking, nothing's going to happen. Nothing ever does happen. So she was not taking any of those things seriously. But at the same time, there was a little terrified voice in there somewhere saying, but what if he's telling the truth? When she found the strength to take her son and leave, what did that mean for her relationship with her family? It ended. She knew that. She knew that if she left, there would be no turning back. She was told, you know, you're turning your back on your faith, on William, on God. It's the end of the world is coming and you're not going to make it to the new era. And she was very frightened of that. And she was more frightened of something happening to Killian. And, you know, she was very frightened that would be her fault. That would be her punishment from God. But she toughed it out and she left. And she said in the weeks that followed, she was checking herself for breast lumps. She was checking Killian for fever. But In a different reality, you know, when you've got a different perspective and a different partner saying, but he wanted you to think that, you know, she was actually starting to feel better. And she went off and had a a belly button pierced and she got a tattoo and she bought a bikini, first bikini, and she celebrated with a cigarette and a can of beer. So she was getting quite bold there with her independence, but she did struggle to make decisions for a long time because 
if you can imagine being in a community where everything is decided for you and you're told what to do every minute of the day, making independent decisions. She had no confidence in her own decisions. It took ages to be able to make a simple decision for herself, but she did. And she said, that's when the partner started to ask about the baby. Why doesn't the baby's father want to see him? And who is the baby's father? And she said, I cared about him too much to lie. So I told him that the baby's father was William Camp. And he said, but isn't he married to your sister? And don't they have six children or something? And and she said, well, but William Camp's married to everybody. Everybody is his queen. Everybody is his wife. And she told him the story. And he said, well, how long has that been going on? And she said, well, since I was 14 or 15, she couldn't actually remember the date. In her statement, she told the police she was 15. But when they did a check on everything and they found the diaries, which had got dates and times and everything, she was actually 14 when the sexual relationship started. So that's when the whole house of cards came tumbling down. When did she decide to go to the police? Was that relationship that she had now on the outside world, was that the most significant factor in empowering her to go and do that? Yes, I think it was a combination of things. The minute she left, her family shunned her. She was an outsider. She was a pariah. She turned her back on God. She'd perish in hell. So the whole community turned on her. And Cam encouraged that because he didn't want anyone else leaving. Even though he'd given her his blessing to go, after she did, he poisoned the waters for her. He told her mother she was to have no contact with Stephanie. And everyone turned their back on her. Her sisters did. After she went to the police and reported him, it got worse. You know, it was even worse. She had her sister on the phone saying, how can you do this to us? You know, William's a man of God. How can you do this? You're evil. So she had to deal with all the repercussions of having reported him. But by then, another young disciple had come forward who had also left some years before, Stephanie. And no one ever really knew why she left. She just suddenly left. And she came forward. I think that Stephanie's then partner contacted her because he wanted to expose what was going on in that cult. He wanted people to know this guy was a pedophile and a con man. And so he'd gone to a TV network and done an interview. But then in the meantime, they'd reported it to the police. So it became a police matter. So that show could not air. But I think he'd actually, or Stephanie had approached this girl to find out why she'd left. So she also made a police statement. And he was also jailed for his crimes against that girl. Do you think before that point, Stephanie even had an awareness of the criminality of Cam's behaviour? Obviously, she knew in her body and mind that it didn't feel right and that it wasn't right and that it had traumatised her. But did she understand that he had broken the law, that he needed to be punished for that? No, she absolutely did not. She really believed that she was doing, she did believe it was God's will. She didn't like it, but she'd been programmed to believe that it was God's will. And when her then partner said, how old were you when this started? He said, the guy's a pedophile. That's rape. He needs to be arrested. You know, that's a crime. What he's done to you is a crime. And she said, no, it's, no it, it was God's will. It's, and he said, it wasn't God's will. It was his will. He's depraved. You know, the guy's a creep. You have to report him. And she was really scared about reporting him. She didn't report him straight away. She thought about it quite a bit first. And she felt terrible. And she said, what if no one believes me? And she knew if she made that complaint, no one would support her. Her family would not support her. None of the other Marys in that uh, environment, would. they'd all turned against her. So she'd be a lonely voice, you know, until this other girl came forward. And there were two of them saying the same thing. And there were very similar stories. The other girl didn't get pregnant. She left fairly quickly. She was, I think, 16 when she left. But that was also an underage. It begun underage in a relationship. But uh, she came forward telling the same story. But the show couldn't go on TV because by then he was arrested and it had become a police matter. So there would be a trial and he was pleading not guilty and he hadn't done anything wrong. And I think he even got Stephanie's mother to write a letter 
to his lawyer saying, you know, Stephanie was troubled and she told lies and she was immoral and all these things that he said about her. She'd broken his code of moral conduct. Isn't that interesting? She broke his code of moral conduct that he wrote and his own code of moral conduct meant the Queen's had to be loyal to him, even though they were underage. Does that speak to the power of his grooming and manipulation that as an adult woman, you know, Stephanie has a son that is the living, breathing proof of his abuse and that she still didn't feel compelled or confident enough on her own to want to hold him to account? Yes, she was very frightened of holding him to account. She was frightened because he was so powerful, I guess, in that cult. He was like a god in that cult. And she said he's so convincing. If you think about it, he convinced 500,000 people that he'd been chosen by God and he possessed the Holy Seed and was told to immaculately scatter it. So, you know, if people are going to believe that, who's going to believe this damaged little girl? And I can understand why she felt reluctant to go to the police. And also she'd got no proof. She didn't have any proof because Killian was born when she was 19 years old. She wasn't underage when she was pregnant. So whilst he was willing to acknowledge there had been a sexual relationship that had led to the birth of their child, he wasn't willing to admit that it started when she was 14. He wasn't admitting to an underage sexual relationship. He was arguing that she was of the age of consent and that it had been a consensual relationship. That was what his case was. And she didn't know she'd got these journals because after the TV show, a TV crew went in from Channel 9 to film a day in the life. They'd obviously got wind of what was going on because there were a procession of babies being born to single mums at the local Bush maternity hospital. So Stephanie wasn't sure whether perhaps a disgruntled former disciple had sort of raised the flag or if someone from the hospital may have waved the flag. But either way, the film crew came in asking him about his visions and you know all this stuff. But then they asked the real questions. The gritty questions were, What about these queens? And he threw them out. As soon as they started asking about the queens, he threw them out and closed the interview down. And Stephanie remembers that clearly. And then they had a purge. So he ordered a purge of all the letters to the Holy Mother. And remember, he was getting everyone to write letters. Anyone that had any doubts wrote to the Holy Mother. And the Holy Mother, or rather him, penned the replies. And they were all grooming type letters. So, um, There was a purge where everything was destroyed. They had a fire. And so Stephanie didn't have any evidence. And then her mother, they went back to the commune to retrieve some things. I think shortly after she left, she went back because she was told, basically, get your stuff and get out. She went back to get some boxes and some bin bags with childhood memorabilia in. And there were things like rosary beads and crucifixes and some exercise books from school, and she just took them and threw them in the cupboard at her new partner's place. But during the trial, they moved house. They moved from Sydney to the Gold Coast because they were being stalked. Their mail was going missing, and her partner became concerned that she might be in danger and that Killian might be in danger. So they left Sydney and went to live on the Gold Coast, and she was unpacking all these boxes and bags. And lo and behold, she came across all these letters So they were diary entries and journal writings, and more importantly, the fake Holy Mother's replies, grooming her for sex, and they had survived the purge. There weren't a lot of them, but she had enough damning evidence to show from his own hand that he was grooming her for sex. And they were dated and timed, and there was a location as to where the sex took place. And basically, it was what would sink him in the court case. So she rang the police and said, you'll never guess what I found. And remember, she'd already made a statement to the police. So these letters actually, it's not like she made a statement after finding them. She'd already made her statement and those letters confirmed everything she told the police. And they were irrefutable evidence of his guilt. How soon after the initial reports were made was William Cam arrested? And what were the followers at the property and now were told, what did they think was happening? Well, they thought she was a little Jezebel. You know, she was evil and she was just trouble and she was making up stories. And I guess if you've been brainwashed that much, it's entrenched in you. 
And anyway, where are you going to go when you've got no money and you've handed all your money over? Where are you going to go even if you wanted to leave? Where to? And they were programmed to fear the outside world and to view it as an evil place where everyone was going to die in doomsday. So, you know, there was some security. So the family especially continued to support him and believe him. She made the report in July 2002. The police were straight onto it. So she made the report. And I think either a week before or a week after, the other girl made her complaint too. So they made police statements. So they had two very similar statements. And they set up a task force called Task Force Winifred. And they did raids. So they did surprise raids. They were obviously watching because Stephanie found amongst the evidence aerial photos of the cult. And in Stephanie's police interview, they showed her the photos, aerial photos of the cult, who lives here, who lives there, which residence belongs to who. And she had to identify all these landmarks within the compound. And then they struck. So the police had simultaneous raids, one on the motel where... William Cam used to take all his queens in Fig Tree and a simultaneous raid on his office in his compound and his home looking for evidence. So those raids collected a lot of very interesting evidence and he was arrested on that day. I think they arrested him in Nara and he was taken straight into custody and charged. So obviously the news got out to the media that he'd been charged with these historic sex crimes and it was all over the media. But it was a long time from then until the trial because you've got the process to follow and there was a committal hearing and actually piles of his supporters turned up in court to support him, which Stephanie found very intimidating. You know, she wasn't just standing up for her truth against him. On occasions, her mum was there as a supporter for William Camp. But all these supporters have seen their, you know, fearless leader taken away in handcuffs, what happened to them when he was eventually charged and taken to prison? Well, it was a long time between times. You know, first of all, there was the committal hearing was a year away from his arrest. So as it was the following year, they had the committal hearing in Nara and there was still a large support crew for him and none for Stephanie, none. And the other girl also gave evidence at the committal. And then he was committed to stand trial. So then there was a process of hearings where he tried to get the case kicked out and failed. So then he was committed to stand trial. Obviously, clever defence barristers separate those two girls because if a jury had two girls telling the same story in the same case, people would start to wonder. So there were two separate trials, one for the first girl, one for Stephanie. So the first trial went ahead in 2005. And he still had all his cronies supporting him then. And then after that trial, he was jailed for five years. And Stephanie's case was still to come up before the courts. So some of the stories that came out in the media, a number of his disciples started to have second thoughts and the cult started to crumble. So a number of people began to leave in 2005, 2006, after the first trial. Not Stephanie's mother. But Stephanie's sisters left the cult. Bettina was still standing by him at that stage. When he was jailed for the first lot of offences, he was worried that his wife and children would be besieged by media outside the cult in Nara. So he sent her to his community in Victoria and he was sent to jail. So when she came home, and Stephanie's case was yet to be heard, when she came home, she got a bit of clarity In her entire married life, she'd never had a moment where he wasn't barking orders at her or preaching to her or threatening her or abusing her. And suddenly she realises how peaceful it is without him around. And she realises she's been in an abusive relationship. And he was appealing his sentence. And she started to panic. What if he does get out? I don't want him back. My life's quite nice without him. I think I need to get out too. So she made plans to escape with the children and she did. Whilst he was in jail, she thought, God has given me this opportunity. Maybe this is the only chance I'm ever going to get to leave. And she did leave the cult with the kids and she went to live in Victoria. So lots of people left, but not Stephanie's mother and stepfather. They stayed. He spent nine years in jail. Was there any evidence found along the way or did police hope that they would be able to add to those charges? Did they find evidence of more 
abuse of underage girls? Well, I can only write on what he was charged with. But how I see it is even the girls that were over the age of consent, which in New South Wales was 16, they were still manipulated. They were still brainwashed. Sexual coercion, which we now recognise now, was rife in there. They weren't willingly having sex with him. They were coerced into having sex, which I still think is a crime. And he wasn't charged with that just because they were deemed to be of the age of consent. But it wasn't really consensual sex at all for any of them. By the time Stephanie's case came up, her mother was a star witness for William Cam, which was totally the ultimate betrayal for Stephanie. But you can actually see in the evidence that Stephanie's mother gave that she was completely brainwashed. So I can only speak on victims he was charged with. He actually got 10 years all up. He got five years jail sentence for the crimes involving the first young woman. He got another five and a half years maximum. That's the maximum sentence. He got a five and a half year maximum sentence for Stephanie, but it was staggered. The judge was quite clever. He staggered the sentences so they didn't all run together. So there were six charges. He gave a sentence for two charges at a time. So the first sentence of five and a half years started on one date. And then the second sentence started maybe a year later. And the third sentence started maybe six months later. So in all, he gave him as long as he possibly could to keep him behind bars. But all that time, Stephanie was on her own. But after her sisters left, they contacted her. And she thought that was a trick. She was so suspicious. She thought that maybe he'd put them up to it, you know, to try and put pressure on her to drop the charges. He hadn't. They genuinely had left. But she was in such a paranoid frame of mind that she was even frightened of having a relationship as much as she wanted it. And it turned out to be genuine. So they began to build bridges, if only by phone, you know. He was paroled in November 2014. What has happened in the years since? Well, I think he assumed, you know, as most offenders, when they're discharged from prison on parole, they have a year parole or maybe two years parole period. He had a year's parole period. So I think he imagined that after one year, he'd just be a free man and he'd go back to living his life. And that's what the community were worried about. That's what the authorities were worried about. He would have gone back to living his life. So when he came out of prison, there were a number of conditions. There were multiple conditions on him to protect the community from him because he was viewed as a high-risk sex offender. He had done no rehabilitation programs in jail. He had shown no remorse whatsoever. He still hasn't. He doesn't think he did anything wrong. He's acting on God's instructions. And by the way, he's in prison suffering for his faith like Jesus on the cross. That's how he saw it. So When he made his first application for parole, it was knocked back in 2013. So I think he realised the writing was on the wall. If he wanted to get out, he had to do a course or two. So he went through the motions and he did a couple of courses. And he was released in 2014. When his parole ran out a year later, the New South Wales Attorney General took him back to court, to the Supreme Court, and said, this man is at risk. He's at very high risk of reoffending. We need this order to continue without strict supervision. He will return to the bush and he will do it all again. So he'd got conditions already with his parole. He had to wear an ankle bracelet, uh, electronic bracelet. He couldn't ring a house where anyone under 18 even lived. He couldn't go to that house. He couldn't go back to his promised land in um, Camberwara, which was a big deal for him because he couldn't preach to his flock and he wasn't allowed to preach to his flock because he wasn't allowed on Facebook and he wasn't allowed to do lots of things he had to hand his passport in that would stop him going to Canada and setting up shop at the Canadian cult you know his arm of the cult in Canada or overseas so they took him back to court and imposed a five-year extended supervision order on him which had all these things in place basically to keep him under surveillance and when that ran out They took him back to court again five years later and asked for it to be renewed for another five years, which he objected to. He said he was rehabilitated. God had decided to postpone the royal house for now until the second coming of Christ. You know, his new royal plans to populate the new era were put on indefinite hold till God said so, which the judge was very sceptical about. 
but they did actually give him a bit of leeway and they extended the order for three years. But then in 2021, he breached it. He was caught breaching it by using his wife's Facebook account, which he's not allowed to do, to contact young women, basically telling them the same sort of stuff that he'd been saying in the past. So he was immediately rearrested and put in jail before breaching that order. And he was in jail for a year until last November on remand awaiting trial. But he changed his mind and pleaded guilty to a minor infraction, which was a minor breach. So that brings us to sort of today, 2023. What is the punishment for those breaches? Well, they gave him a prison sentence of one year, but he'd served one year on remand. So they counted that as time served. It was a minor infraction in the scheme of things. He wasn't contacting underage girls, but he was contacting girls of age that looked like children. They looked like children. And he was contacting them overseas. So still targeting good Catholic families, still targeting girls that fitted his ideal but were legally of age. So he couldn't be prosecuted for breaking his order by contacting young girls, which I think is what the police were suspicious he'd been doing. So basically, he spent a year in jail while they, on remand, while they sorted it out. And he changed his plea from not guilty to guilty. And he pleaded guilty to a lesser charge. And the judge gave him one year and six days, I think, which was exactly the amount of time he'd served on remand. So he came home that day. And they've reimposed the extended supervision order. So that was suspended while he was in jail for a year. So it's been reinstated and he's still subject to all this strict monitoring until 2025. So if he puts a toe out of line, he'll be back inside. So if I understand it correctly, he is a quote unquote free man today, but his life is under strict conditions and monitoring to try and ensure that he does not resume the life of the cult leader he once was. Totally. So, for example, he's still not allowed to go back to his promised land. Now, that's an issue because just before he breached his order, he went to court and they asked for the order to be varied because he's an old, frail man living in an apartment in Sydney and it's very expensive and he just he's sick and he's got skull cancer or something and he's got impotence and therefore... He should be allowed to go back to his cult because there's hardly anybody there. They're all old and frail, and he should be allowed to go back to his community in Camberwara. The judge actually upheld that and said, yes, I agree. I will approve his return to Camberwara on condition the Office of Corrections, who were monitoring him, agree, and they didn't. So he remains in exile in an apartment in Sydney's CBD indefinitely until such time as they determine he's safe, which they haven't. How many children did William Cam father? Well, I'm on a conservative estimate from the people I've spoken to, would say he's on a conservative estimate got at least 20 children. And that includes the ones to his first wife, four children to his first wife, Anne, six children with Bettina, his child with Stephanie, and countless other young single women who became his queens. That's a conservative estimate. Other members of, former members of his cult have said they believe it may be greater than that, but who knows. And where is Steph at today? What is her life like on the other side of a life as William Cam's bride? I think that writing this book or telling her story to me has been very, very empowering. It's been very empowering. We had to get a court order lifted to allow her to do that. So after the second trial, there was an order that effectively gagged her from talking. The order was to protect her. You know, she's a young girl, victim of a sexual crime, and judges impose these orders to keep everybody out of court and to protect the identity of the person who's telling that dreadful story. And she was happy with that, and it protected her for a long time. But she reached a stage when she was in her late 30s when she was contacting me where she actually wanted to tell her story. And I said, you know, in order to do that, and for people to actually hold the thought that it's real, it's a true story, not some fantastical work of fiction on my part, but it actually happened, and it happened to real people, 
in order to do that and in order to have a photo of her on the front cover of the book, in order for her to tell her story to media, we had to get that order lifted. So we tracked down the retired judge who'd put the order on in the first place and he was agreeable to lifting that order so that she could tell her story. We also had to get a letter from her son because obviously by identifying Stephanie, we were identifying Killian as the victim of a sexual crime. And he was very supportive. He said, by the time the book comes out, I'll be over 18. He's actually 23. It's taken a long time and we had COVID in between. And it was a lot of research. So, you know, we got that order lifted. She feels empowered because in all those letters, and I think revisiting all those letters has been draining for her. And we sat down and went through them. We've had many, many, many interviews where she sat and cried. We've had interviews where she's been angry. We've had other interviews where she's laughed out loud and said, gosh, who would even believe that stuff now? As an adult looking back, for goodness sake, who would possibly have believed any of that stuff? And she feels like she's reclaimed some of that lost power and right back off him because while that gag order was on her, he was on Facebook on their Little Pebble website sounding off all over the place saying that they were liars, these girls, they'd lied about him, they were evil and wicked and basically they made it all up. They were the ones writing seductive letters to him because they were the ones that wanted him. But they were children, sort of overlooking the fact that two juries found him guilty. So she wasn't allowed a right of reply to any of that because of the gag order. So now having had it lifted, I said to Stephanie, I think we should finish the book with a letter from you. Don't you think you should have the last say here? He's written all these things about you. How about you write a letter? saying all the things you never got to say. And she thought that was a fabulous idea. So she came up with this letter and she did have the last say and she is empowered by it. I think looking back now, she's not upset anymore or ashamed. I think that's more to the book, not ashamed. She's furious. She's furious that he did this to her and her family and lots of other people. And she is warning the world that in that letter, she said he will do it again. And lo and behold, just as we went to press, he was back in trouble again for breaking his order. And she warned in that letter that he would break that order. And he did. Thanks to Megan for assisting us to tell this story. If you want to learn more about Stephanie's story, William Cam and the Order of St. Charbel, you can find a link to Megan's book, The Messiah's Bride, in the episode description. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Emma Gillespie. The executive producer is Gia Moylan with assistant production by Cassie Merritt. Our audio design is by Rhiannon Mooney. And if you enjoyed today's episode, we would love it if you could leave us a review on whichever podcast app you're listening to right now. It helps other true crime fans find our content and it helps us to keep making the episodes that you get to enjoy every week. Thanks so much for listening. I'll be back next week with another true crime conversation.